Week four, it's actually week seven. Does that make any sense? We took a couple breaks. Last week we had a short snow break, short snow break. Not sure how that came out. Did you all enjoy the snow break? I mean, my wife and I were still kind of fascinated with the whole thing, and that's going to last, I think, about six more days. And we're no longer going to be, I, but, I'm, but I'm still, we, we spend, I don't know, half of our day standing at the window. <gasps> this is so cool. And you all are going, California freaks, man, I tell you what. <laughs> So then two weeks ago, I, I just, I love two weeks ago, uh, call it correct thing, it's not, it's football Sunday. That was some amazing testimonies about what Christ is doing in the work of professional athletes. Would you agree? Can I get a, can I get an, at least an amen here? Huh? That'll work, that'll work. Um, so after just a couple weeks of um, off, I'm going to jump into kind of something heavy. Um, and I, based on the news this morning, I nearly just kind of tossed this out, but I decided, you know what, um, this message is in, in honor and in memory of Kathy Lover and every person who sacrifices and gives, and, the, and their life is marked by that sacrifice and giving. This is about you. Um, this is a reflection of our Holy Spirit. This is a reflection of our God and, and Jesus Christ, and we see what I'm going to be talking about reflected in the face of People like Kathy, Kathy Lober, our co-president of our Nazarene Missions International. A movie came out a while back called The Passion, The Passion of the Christ, short-term Mel Gibson movie. How many saw that movie? Um, pretty gory, bloody movie. I mean, it, it disturbed me. Um, I, I watched it, and I, my pastor and I, I, we were talking afterwards, and I said, uh, wow, that was, did, did, did it really need to have all that? Did we really need to see all that? And, he, and he, he wasn't angry, but he looked at me like really a hard stare. And, and I don't know if he was upset with me or he was amazed that I didn't quite understand, but he basically said, Jerry, if you, if you didn't understand all of that horribleness in that movie, then you, you might not understand the depths of your sin and the destructive depths that your sin will take people, not only you, but everybody you know. You don't get it, Jerry. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm your youth pastor. <laughs> but I got to thinking about that, and, and, it, and it began to weigh on me, and I began to realize that, that what Christ went through, that, that, was, he, that was, we'll never understand that. As humans, we have a certain level of, of awareness and pain and sorrow, but as the divine, we, we, we simply can't understand that. We, we, we just can't. So I want, to, I want to read a passage this morning, and I'm going to put an image up there, and I apologize for this image. The children are gone, but this image, I think, sets the tone for this passage in a language that I think every person in this room can understand. It's not English. It's not Hebrew. It's not Greek. It's a visual language. This is the story of the faith of Abraham. Some of your Bibles might call it the near sacrifice of, of Isaac. But I'm just going to read this passage to you. This is in Genesis chapter 22. I'll start in verse 1. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied, and you're going to see that phrase, here I am, throughout Scripture. It indicates a person who says, you know, Father, I'm going to stand right next to you. I'm not going to go run and hide. I'm not going to be, I'm going to stand in perfect relationship with you. Here I am. I'm right next to, I will stand beside you in whatever you tell me. I'm, I'm right here beside you. I'm right here beside you. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering, a burnt offering. Most offerings were not burnt offerings. A burnt offering was a total. The entire sacrifice was consumed. Most offerings, only a portion of it, the innards, stuff, and, and then there was a fellowship feast afterwards. You fellowship in the presence of the God that you are sacrificing to, the one and only God, the true God. But a burnt offering, the entire thing is consumed. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. In verse 3, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey, and he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. Verse 4, when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. In verse 4, excuse me. And on the same, excuse me, on the third day, y'all catch that. You, you feeling the, I'm just, I'm just going to let you figure that out. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Verse 7, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. 
Well, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where's the lamb? You feeling the connections here? Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. My son, and the two of them went on together. When they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it, and he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Whatever you say. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him, because now I know. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. And we know that God loves us and continues to take care of us. Why? Because he gave his only son, his one and only son for us. If you bow your heads, we're going to continue to worship in song. I'm going to come back up and present some scripture. Bow your heads, Father. This, is, this story is disturbing. In the midst of what we found out this morning, this story is simply disturbing. And yet this morning, Lord, you have a hard truth for us, a hard truth that many people in this room have been living out for so many years now. And yet I think there are other folks in this room who have what I'm going to present is it's going to scare them away. I have a feeling this morning, Lord, that there might be people who say this is too hard of a saying. I'm not sure I want to follow this Christ. Father, help, help me present this message from your word. Empowered by your spirit, this, your living word, that people would be willing to accept this hard truth and find life. Just as Kathy Lober has found life. Father, help us this morning. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Let's continue, Heidi. Thanks. Did you know, maybe you weren't aware of this, what we're doing in here is nothing new. This has been going on since before y'all or any. Watch this. Check this out. This is amazing. Worship at the dawn of time. In the heavens above, this is in Revelation chapter 4, day and night they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. These were the cherubim or the cherubs surrounding the throne of, in heaven, always praising his name, protecting his glory, protecting his honor. This has been going on. This is John going through a door in the early part of Revelations and, and capturing a, a picture of heaven. And not only have we been worshiping on, in the heavens above, but worship has been going on here on earth too. Did you know that? In Psalm 148, verse 3, it says this, Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. And the incredible thing about this early worship is that it was, it was perfect worship. Creation obeyed the creator. There was nothing wrong with creation at all. There was no earthquakes. There was, no, there was none of this, this pain and this sorrow and this suffering. Creation submitted to God's will. Perfect worship. Did you also know that there was once perfect worship in the garden? Perfect worship in the garden. But in Genesis chapter 3, and if you look in your Bibles, there's usually a title at the top of chapter 3. It says what? The fall. You're like, oh, wow, that came early in the story. <laughs> in chapter 3, verse 8, we learn that worship got all messed up. It says this, chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Then the man and the wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord 
God among the trees of the garden. Now, although this is kind of late in the narrative, and we're going to go back just a little bit in the narrative here, um, we see a couple things still that are very important that are contained right here in this verse. Number one, it would appear that God would visit them regularly. And again, scholars and theologians aren't sure if he was bodily there because he's in spirit. He's a spirit, uh, not a spirit, but spirit. Um, some people feel that in this, this, this passage here that, that, that his presence was so real and was felt so intensely that it was just like he was walking right beside us. I mean, the experience was so intense, perfect worship. But we also learn that being close to a, a, in a close relationship with God brings the good life, the abundant life, life eternal. And, and we see this in the entire narrative. But then the third thing we learn that is something has gone terribly wrong because they're hiding from their God. You ever, ever hidden from your God? Hidden? Okay, how about this? Have you ever hidden from your mom and dad? Okay, so you've hidden from God. You can't fool me, all right? So God set a rhythm or what would be called a liturgy. Right? He had set a, a rhythm into their lives. A liturgy is nothing more than a practice. We, we in church, you know, a liturgical church has some very set rituals. Um, we're pretty much a non-liturgical church because we yabber and talk and kind of free flow. Um, but liturgy really means just kind of a way of doing life. And this rhythm or this liturgy was built into Adam and Eve's very lives. And its purpose was to keep their love centered on the creator because they would be tempted to love the creation more than the creator because Adam's looking at her going, yeah, you get it, right? Okay, no, all right, that's fine, it's fine. But this, this, this liturgy, this way of doing life, again, it would help them keep their love centered and keep their loves pure. See, the creation can't derive life from creation. We only derive life from the creator. And yet we continue to try to derive life from each other. And what do we do? We just suck each other dry. That's just kind of crazy. We learn later that this liturgy or this practice is, is, is called worship. And here's what the liturgy woven into the very fabric, the very order of their life looked like. Take a look at this. It's kind of a three-step thing. There was a call to worship through word and sacrament. And I want you to notice right now, sacrament is very close to the word sacrifice. Just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. We're going to come back to that point. Hit that next slide there. Well, there we go. Call to worship through word and sacrament. And then our response through faith and obedience. We're going to talk about that a little bit. And then if we respond properly to his call of worship, then we have a fellowship meal with our Heavenly Father, union and communion with God, enjoying all the, the produce and all the goodness in the garden. Now watch how this unfolds. Watch this. This is in chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 9, and then 16 and 17. And in verse 9, it says this, The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for the food. Basically, in this passage, everything has been provided by the hand of God. Everything has been provided by the hand of God for their enjoyment, for their pure enjoyment. Basically, garden, hey, go have fun. Do whatever you want. To have a blast. Be like bunnies. Okay, the kids aren't here. All right. Verse 16 and 17, it says this. In the middle of the garden, there were two trees. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in these two trees, we find out there's a choice. A choice between life and death. Verse 16, it says this. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any of the trees in the garden, including and particularly the tree of life. Man, you, you, you got it made. But, verse 17, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And here we have the incredible mind-blowing dignity of choosing to worship and honor God or choosing not to worship and honor God and the inevitable consequences that would follow. And it's not like God's going to punish you if you don't do it right. It, there are inevitable consequences when we don't love properly. We all know this. We've all seen it happen. We see it in the newspapers. When love isn't carried out properly, people are hurt, and they're abused, and they're used. So we have this set liturgy, this way of doing life with our Creator. First of all is the call to worship. Hit that next slide there. 
The call to worship through word and sacrament. Now watch this closely. The word is do this. Have fun in the garden. You can eat anything you want. All, it's all good and pleasing to the eye. It's good for the soul. It's good for physical physiology. I mean, it's good for everything. I mean, just go for it. But, and here's the sacrament or the fast or the sacrifice. It's always been a part of worship from day one, a sacrifice. And what's the sacrifice? What's the fast? What's the sacrament? Don't eat from this tree. You have a choice. Do all, enjoy all this, but I'm gonna, I have to set up a choice or you're not really free. I gave you the ability to choose me or not choose me. Therefore, I have to lay before you life and death. And that's what he does. He gives them the option. Do this, but don't do that. The word and then the sacrament, the sacrifice for his honor. We'll give up some of what we want because what he wants is more important. Sacrifice has always been a part of worship. Again, think Kathy Lober. Just think Kathy Lober. So you have the call to worship and then you have our response. Do we obey or do we not obey? They didn't. We don't. Right? Faith always precedes obedience, and this is something I did in last week's video because, you know, nobody could come to church, so I did a quick little seven-minute video. You can go check that out on our Facebook page. But bottom line, if you don't trust or if you don't have faith in the instructor, you won't have faith in the instructions. Does that make sense? In fact, you will have contempt for the instructor. And when you have contempt, contempt for the instructor, you're definitely not going to follow the instructions Faith precedes obedience. If I don't trust my dad when he tells me something, I probably won't obey. I did it a lot. Maybe you did. If I lack faith, I'm not going to obey. But today, by, by we, if we respond in, by obedience um, through faith... Um, we have a fellowship meal, union and communion with God, eternal life, abundant life, all the different terms that the Bible uses, that Jesus uses, life everlasting, joy and purpose and significance and value and dignity. For all creation, human and beast, keep that in mind, dignity for all of creation, both human and beast. The call to worship, our response of obedience, fellowship with God, the liturgy of life. And we see this again, the liturgy of life, this last part. It, again, we'll take a look at chapter or verse 17 one more time. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will surely die. Disobey and die, but implicit is the opposite. Obey and live. Obey my word. Sacrifice. Fast. Withhold a little bit of your desires for my honor and for my sake. And we will have communion. We'll walk together in the garden. Three simple steps. Well, in chapter 3, they didn't obey. <laughs> That's what we learned. They exchanged worship of the creator for worship of the creation. And by way of disobedience, Adam and Eve introduced into the human life the liturgy of idolatry. It becomes a part of our regular life. It becomes a part of the fabric of our very existence. But here's the great news. Because God, excuse me, because they disobeyed God, he provided an altar an altered sacrament. No longer was it obedience, because they weren't. But now, verse 17, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and wife and his wife and clothed him. Uh, those garments were made, an animal had to die if you didn't catch that. So no longer are humans and beasts in perfect unity now Somebody innocent in creation has to pay for the guilty in creation. That's, it's, it was the covenant. It's, it's a new covenant that God set up. He had, had to, he had set up this covenant of obedience, but now he's got to set up a new covenant because he loves us so much. He, calls, he, set, he sets up a covenant of grace, an incredible covenant of grace. In Genesis chapter 3, he, we, we get a promise of a son who will one day bruise or crush the head of the serpent in, and, and the implication is that one day uh, there would be a perfect son who would in perfect obedience lead us all back to perfect worship because clearly worship is, has gone astray just a little bit but until that time worship through animal sacrifice again sacrifice never leaves the scene when we worship sacrifice is always a part of our worship 
So through sacrifice, again, however, because of sin, new essential elements are incorporated into the worship of God. No longer is it just worship or a, a, a call to worship and then our response and then a fellowship meal. No, we, all, we mess that up. And now there's a whole bunch. And if you take a look at I've put some scriptures. Uh, hit that next slide there. Um, Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter, 9, chapter 19 through chapter 24, verse 11, there's this, this uh, description of, of a worship service and how integral sacrifice is a part of it. But now, instead of just that simple three-step uh, deal, we, we've got something incredibly involved now. Now we're gathering and we're cleansing and we have mediated access. We have the sacrifice of animals. We have divine communication. We have cleansing. We have consecration. We have a whole bunch of stuff to cover us because we don't obey. So through all the ritual and the ceremony, there's a whole lot of washing and cleansing and symbolic ritual, but it's supposed to represent what's going on inside, inside of us. Creation pays the consequences for our sins. Worship that began and failed with Adam is at least partially, this is good news, partially and imperfectly, it gets brought back through Israel and, and Solomon. Israel at Mount Sinai, and again in Exodus, you have this incredible, incredible worship ceremony intricately involved with a sacrifice. And again in Mount Zion, Jerusalem, King Solomon, it's recorded in 2 Chronicles. Check that out for uh, chapters 15 through 17, uh, 5 through 7. Added a one there. Um, this incredibly long, um, the, the number, as you, as you read the numbers, you're, you're going to be staggered somewhat. The number of sacrifices that Solomon performed because of his incredible level of honor in God. Yet the worship of God isn't perfected and it's, it's never fully realized. On Mount Sinai, they get the law and what do they do immediately? They melt everybody's jewelry down and build a golden calf because that's kind of what they had worshipped back in Israel and they thought, ooh, we left the wrong God behind. We better bring him along. It was like an idol. It is an idol. Same thing happened on Mount Zion, Jerusalem, a thousand years later, King Solomon. Boy, he's, man, he's, he's on it, but then what does he do? Absolute power, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. He ended up with just a whole mess of foreign lives and they, wives, and they brought in a whole bunch of their idols and corrupted. Worship got a good start and then, again, kind of fell apart. And yet, and here's the amazing thing, God was okay with these animal sacrifices because it was their response to a gracious arrangement, the covenant of grace. We look back at that right now and we think that is absolutely horrible, but this is what God put in place and they obeyed. That was their response, so he honored that response. Even though they honored it incredibly imperfectly, as we're going to find out, he still honored it because that was his arrangement that he set up because we couldn't obey. And yet he still loved us and he didn't want to see us perish. So well, we'll just come up with plan B. Sacrifice, worship through sacrifice. But God's covenant of grace is still in effect. Even though the heart change that Ezekiel told us about, that would be written on our hearts, right, and it would be put in our spirits and would cause us to walk in his ways, that hadn't happened yet. That's going to require a perfect son to come to his temple to purify the sons of Levi and to restore right worship in Zion. We have perfected worship in Jesus Christ. Think back now. Adam and Eve, where'd they go wrong? They disobeyed. The Son of God comes and he doesn't disobey. He obeys perfectly. And in him is now perfect worship. And at the end of the Old Testament, we're left hoping for this Christ, this Messiah, this Son of God, who would worship God perfectly and then lead his bride, us, lead his bride into the pure worship of the one true God. And that expectation is met finally in God's son, Jesus Christ. Only the unblemished lamb of God can cover the sins within this covenant of grace, which leads us to our final step this morning, our worship. A little history lesson here. The image again, sacrifice in worship. In Romans 12, 1, we read this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy... In view of everything that God has done, in view of chapter 11, go home and read chapter 11 and just fall to your knees. 
in view of what God has done through the promise, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. And I just want you to think for a moment, the living sacrifice was laid on the altar. Think back to Abraham and Isaac. Laid them on the altar. Paul's saying, y'all come up here and put yourselves on the altar and if it had been a thousand years ago, we would slit your net and bleed you. But Paul's saying, what I want you to do now is I, I don't want to take your life. I want you to give your life. I want you to be a living sacrifice. Now, remember the burnt offering is a complete, total consumption. Gone. Completely, utterly offered to God. Paul's saying, y'all are a burnt offering. Offer yourselves as a burnt offering. Lay yourselves on the altar. Not literally. You get the idea. Allow him to consume you entirely. Making sacrifices of the Lord before the Lord is the way we worship him. When we make sacrifices, we're saying that to whom we sacrifice is more important than what we sacrifice. It's worth more. It's worth far more than what we're sacrificing. But does it matter what I sacrifice and how I sacrifice? A lot of people get into this with tithes. Hey, you know, I put in, I, you know, does it, does, it, does it really matter? Well, it matters in that it reveals your heart. Look back to Cain and Abel. Abel gave the very best, the first of, representing the best and the first, his future. He gave his future to God. Cain says he grabbed some on the way in. I know when I dated my daughter, my, excuse me, oh, that sounded horrible. I dated my wife. <laughs> I, would, I would get off from the restaurant two or three in the morning, and I would come home, and, and I would look for people's gardens, and I would stop, and I would pick flowers, and I would give them to my wife. I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed to admit that. Um, but yeah, Diane, that's where you got it. I got, you knew that. I, I think I admitted that to you at some point. Your sacrifices reveal your... I was a horrible husband early on. We'll just, okay, we'll just go over that. Listen, our sacrifices reveal our worship, all right? Our sacrifices reveal our worship. For example, again, if a friend said to you, hey, you know, my wife, she's straight nuts. Man, it was, it was our anniversary, and I took her out to a meal, and we went and saw a movie, and she's upset. Man, I cannot please that woman. Oh, whoo-wee. And, and, but, but then you find out, you find out that um, he took her to McDonald's, okay? And, and he got a Netflix movie because he told her straight to her face, I really want to buy a new rifle. Can you say contempt? Does that, does that word come to mind just a little bit? And Valentine's Day just passed, so I'm, I'm feeling really, really horrible standing up here. Uh, Diane is an amazing gift giver, and I'm horrible, but that, again, is a different sermon entirely. All of a sudden, we begin to understand why his wife is upset and questioning his love, right? So what we sacrifice and how we sacrifice, yeah, it matters because it reveals our heart. Now, let me show you the same kind of contempt in Scripture. This is in Malachi chapter 1. This is God talking through the prophet Malachi. The Lord says through the mouth of Malachi, a son honors his father and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? And if I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty. Verse 6, it says, it is you priests who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? And the Lord replied, by offering defiled food for my altar. Deficient offerings but you ask how have we defiled you verse 7 8 by saying that the lord's table is contemptible because when you offer blind animals for sacrifice is that not wrong that's a rhetorical question by the way when you sacrifice lame or diseased animals is that not wrong See, they were trying to worship the Lord with the animals that were broken diseased left over they were about to die hey, yeah this will work he'll, he'll be fine with this because all we're supposed to do is present an animal, right? We're following the letter of the law. Clearly not the spirit of the law. Verse 8, try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you? Says the Lord God Almighty. See, when we offer sacrifices to the Lord, the things that we don't really want or that we don't need or that we can easily part with, um, it does speak of worship, but it doesn't speak of worshiping God. It speaks of worshiping ourselves. Just... I, Again, I, I know some of you are like, wow, I hate this message. We'll come back next week. 
A key point here, and I understand this, is not so much the actual amount. It's not so much the actual amount as much as it is the actual amount relative to what you have or what you don't have. In the Gospel of Mark, we have this incredible story. Jesus Christ, he's sitting there with his disciples, and they're watching people come into the temple, and the really, really rich people, they're coming through, showy, they've got their robes, they're looking good, looking mighty fine, and they're putting in tons of money, and they're looking even better. And then a widow comes up, the poor widow, and she puts in two mites, something, a penny, half a penny, something like that. I'm not terribly sure what it is. And he says this to his disciples. He calls his disciples together, and he says, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than the treasury, into the treasury, than all the others combined. They gave out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty. She put in everything, all she had to live on. One final thought, and this one's going to hurt the most. Um, literally, this is going to sting. Hit the next slide there. Sacrifice is worship when our sacrifice is costly. Those of you who are married understand what I'm talking about. It may cost us our ability to go on a vacation every year. It may cost us our ability to get a new car every year. I'm not saying that we shouldn't go on vacation. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have cars. What I'm saying is if we don't have to wait for something, if we don't have to sacrifice something, this is between you and God. Are you truly worshiping him or are you worshiping you and your desires and your will? It is reflected in your gift, your sacrifice, your worship. King David was going to build an altar. The Lord had commanded him, I want you to build an altar. I want you to build it on this threshing floor. Um, it was owned by somebody else. And so David went to this, this person, and this person very generously, he had a good guy, he said, hey, King David, hey, 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 I will give you the threshing floor. I will give you the wood. I will give you the sacrifice. You don't, it won't cost you anything. I got you covered. I got you. King David reply, replied this. He says, no. This is in 2 Samuel, verse 24, out of the chap 20, uh, 24th chapter. He says, no, I insist on paying for it. I will not sacrifice, I will not worship to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. Is that okay if I change that just a little bit? So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. Now listen, for some of you, sacrifices marked your life. This message is in honor of somebody just like that. Some of you in this room, this is, this is history. You've lived a life of sacrifice. And there are a lot of others you, you're thinking, wow, I'd like to have all that goodness and wonderful and everything, but do you really gotta? Here's the funny thing about God. Very often, not very often does he front load blessings. Does that make sense? It's called faith. Do you have faith that if you give back what is due him, he owns it all anyway, and he's asking for 10% back because he's going to bless you with that rest of that 90%, but you cannot get the front load blessing. You got to act on faith. Some of you have never tithed. Some of you have never served. You're looking around the church, our organization right now, and you're thinking we've had a few people leave. Yeah, I could possibly. My guess is there are a lot of you who God has been tapping. Maybe he did it through me. <laughs> I've been calling you. Are you prepared to serve? Are you prepared to sacrifice? Are you prepared to give again and again of your time and your ministry and your energies and your emotion? Because serving is emotional. It drains you. Are you prepared for that closer life, that incredible life that God has planned for you? Hebrews 11, chapter, excuse me, chapter 11, verses 1 and 2 says it this way. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see, all the blessings, all the promises. This is what all the ancients were commended for. They continued to give. They continued to sacrifice for a promise that they never got to see. We now get to experience because we're post-Jesus. You wouldn't want to live in a world pre-Jesus, I promise you. Ugly world. Post-Jesus, change the world. This is what the ancients were commended for. Again, and I'm going to bring... God's been banging. He's been knocking. 
you, you know, every single one of you know, I don't, I don't know what all your separate circumstances are, um, but a passage comes to mind. I, I, this, I don't want you to take the wrong impression, but sin is crouching at your door. You can say no. I believe that some part of creation will pay for your no, for your decision to not sacrifice Somewhere in creation, a price will be paid. I know you don't like this teaching, but this is the truth. So I want to close right now. If you'd bow your heads. Father, I don't know what you're saying to these people. If it's the same thing that you've been telling me my whole life and that you've been whispering to my ear my whole life, I, I kind of have a feeling of what you've been telling them. Father, sin is always crouching at our door, but we can master it by choosing life over death. We can choose to embrace who we are as human beings, or we can walk away and hide. Lord, I know, I know so many people in this, in this room, they would prefer to just hide. Lord, just, you know, at the end of time, just come and get me. I'll be hiding in the corner. Father, help us to come into the light. Help us to have faith that if we step forward in whatever it is that God's Spirit is laying on your heart, if you submit and if you accept that call, that sac- and it's going to be a sacrifice, Father. We know this. Everyone in this room knows this. It's going to be a sacrifice, Father. But creation, somewhere in creation, and quite possibly in our own lives, in our own family, in our own circles, somewhere in creation, there's going to be a huge benefit. Somebody is going to find life because we sacrificed. Father, thank you for your son this morning. Your one and your only son whom you love. That image is burned into our our memory now. Father, thank you for the example of your son and that we got to see the results of his sacrifice, life. Father, thank you for this worship service. Thank you for the fact that Kathy Lober is standing beside you now. Thank you for the fact that you fixed everything. In your sons, I pray. Jesus, thank you.